The Rope of Fear by Mary E. and Thomas W. Hanshu. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. The Rope of Fear by Mary E. and Thomas W. Hanshu. If you know anything of the country of Westmoreland, you will know the chief market town of Merton Shepherd. And if you know Merton Shepherd, you will know there is only one important building in that town besides the massive town hall, and that building is the Westmoreland Union Bank. A private concern, well backed by every wealthy magnate in the surrounding district, and patronized by everyone from the highest to the lowest degree. Anybody will point the building out to you, firstly because of its imposing exterior, and secondly because every one in the whole county brings his money to Mr. Naylor Brent, to do with it what he wills. For Mr. Naylor Brent is the manager, and besides being known far and wide for his integrity, his uprightness of purpose, and his strict sense of justice, he acts to the poorer inhabitants of Merton Shepherd as a sort of father-confessor in all their troubles, both of a social and a financial character. It was toward the last of September that the big robbery happened, and upon one sunny afternoon, at the end of that month, Mr. Naylor Brent was pacing the narrow confines of his handsomely appointed room in the bank, visibly disturbed. That he was awaiting the arrival of someone was evident by his frequent glances at the marble clock which stood upon the mantel-shelf, and which bore across its base a silver plate upon which were inscribed the names of some fifteen or more grateful customers, whose money had passed successfully through his managerial hands. At length the door opened, after a discreet knock upon its oaken panels, and an old, bent, and almost decrepit clerk ushered in the portly figure of Mr. Maverick Narkom, superintendent of Scotland Yard, followed by a heavily built, dull-looking person in navy blue. Mr. Naylor Brent's good-looking, rugged face took on an expression of the keenest relief. "'Mr. Narkom himself! This is indeed more than I expected,' he said, with extended hand. "'We had the pleasure of meeting once in London, some years ago. Perhaps you have forgotten?' Mr. Narkom's bland face wrinkled into a smile of appreciation. "'Oh, no, I haven't,' he returned pleasantly. "'I remember quite distinctly.' I decided to answer your letter in person, and bring with me one of my best men, friend and colleague, you know, Mr. George Headland. Pleased to meet you, sir, and if you'll both sit down, we can go into the matter at once. That's a comfortable chair over there, Mr. Headland. They seated themselves, and Mr. Narkom, clearing his throat, proceeded in his usual official manner to take the floor. "'I understand from headquarters,' said he, "'that you have had an exceptionally large deposit of banknotes "'sent up from London for payments in connection with your new canal. "'Isn't that so, Mr. Brent? "'I trust the trouble you mentioned in your letter has nothing to do with this money.' "'Mr. Naylor Brent's face paled considerably, "'and his voice had an anxious note in it when he spoke. "'Gad, sir, but it has!' he ejaculated. "'That's the trouble itself.' Every single banknote is gone. Two hundred thousand pounds is gone, and not a trace of it. Heaven only knows what I'm going to do about it, Mr. Narkom, but that's how the matter stands. Every penny is gone. Gone! Mr. Narkom drew out a red silk handkerchief and wiped his forehead vigorously, a sure sign of nervous excitement, while Mr. Headland exclaimed loudly, "'Well, I'm hanged!' "'Someone certainly will be,' rapped out Mr. Brent sharply, "'for not only have the notes vanished, "'but I've lost the best night watchman I ever had, "'a good, trustworthy man.' "'Lost him?' put in Mr. Headland curiously. "'What exactly do you mean by that, Mr. Brent? "'Did he vanish with the notes?' "'What? Will Simmons? Never in this world. "'He's not that kind.' The man that offered Will Simmons a bribe to betray his trust would answer for it with his life. A more faithful servant or better fellow never drew breath. No, it's dead he is, Mr. Headland, and oh, I can hardly speak of it yet. I feel so much to blame for putting him on the job at all, but you see we've had a regular series of petty thefts lately. 
small sums unable to be accounted for, safes opened in the most mysterious manner, and money abstracted. Though never any large sums, fortunately, even the clerk's coats had not been left untouched. I have had a constant watch kept, but all in vain. So naturally, when this big deposit came to hand on Tuesday morning, I determined that special precautions should be taken at night, and put poor old Simmons down in the vault with the bank's watchdog for company. That was the last time I saw him alive. He was found writhing in convulsions, and by the time that the doctor arrived upon the scene he was dead. The safe was found open, and every note was gone. Bad business indeed, declared Mr. Headland, with a shake of the head. No idea as to the cause of death, Mr. Brent? What was the doctor's verdict? Mr. Naylor Brent's face clouded. That's the very dickens of it. He didn't quite know. Said it was evidently a case of poisoning, but was unable to decide further, or to find out what sort of poison, if any, had been used. Hmm, I see. And what did the local police say? Have they found any clues yet? The manager flushed, and he gave vent to a forced laugh. As a matter of fact, he responded, the local police know nothing about it. I have kept the loss an entire secret until I could call in the help of Scotland Yard. A secret, Mr. Brent, with such a loss? ejaculated Mr. Narkom. That's surely an unusual course to pursue. When a bank loses such a large sum of money, and in bank notes, the most easily handled commodity in the world, and in addition a mysterious murder takes place, one would naturally expect that the first act would be to call in the officers of the law. That is, unless... I see. Well, it's more than I do, responded Mr. Brent sadly. Do you see any light, however? Hardly that but it stands to reason that if you are prepared to make good the loss, a course to which there seems no alternative, there is an obvious possibility that you yourself have some faint idea as to who the criminal is, and are anxious that your suspicions should not be verified. Mr. Headland, otherwise Cleek, looked at his friend with considerable admiration shining in his eyes. Beginning to use his old head at last, he thought as he watched the superintendent's keen face. Well, well, it's never too late to mend, anyhow. And then aloud, Exactly my thought, Mr. Narkom. Perhaps Mr. Brent could enlighten us as to his own suspicions, for I'm positive that he has some tucked away somewhere in his mind. Jove, if you're not almost supernatural, Mr. Headland, returned that gentleman with a heavy sigh. You have certainly unearthed something which I thought was hidden only in my own soul. That is exactly the reason I have kept silent. My suspicions, were I to voice them, might, er, drag the person accused still deeper into the mire of his own foolishness. There's Patterson, for instance. He would arrest him on sight without the slightest compunction. Patterson? threw in Cleek quickly. Patterson. The name's familiar. Don't suppose, though, that it would be the same one. It is a common enough name. Company promoter, who made a pile on copper the first year of the war, and retired with the swag, to put it brutally. Tisn't that chap, I suppose. The identical man, returned Mr. Brent excitedly. He came here some five years ago, bought up Mount Morris Court, a fine place having a view of the whole town, and he has lately started to run an opposition bank two hours doing everything in his power to overthrow my position here. It's, it's spite, I believe, against myself as well as George. The young fool had the impudence to ask his daughter's hand, and what was more, ran off with her and they were married, which increased Patterson's hatred of us both almost to insanity. Hmm, I see, said Cleek. Who is George? My stepson, Mr. Headland, unfortunately for me, my late wife's boy by her first marriage. I have to admit it regretfully enough, he was the cause of his mother's death. He literally broke her heart by his wild living, and I was only too glad to give him a small allowance, which, however, helped him with his unhappy marriage, and hoped to see the last of George Barrington. Cleek twitched up an inquiring eyebrow. 
unhappy, Mr. Brent? he queried. But I understood from you a moment ago it was a love match. In the beginning it was purely a question of love, Mr. Headland, responded the manager gravely. But as you know, when poverty comes in at the door, love sometimes flies out the window, and from all accounts the late Miss Patterson never ceases to regret the day she became Mrs. George Barrington. George has been hanging about here this last week or two, and I noticed him trying to renew acquaintance with old Simmons only a day or two ago in the bar of the Rosen Anchor. He... he was also seen prowling round the bank on Tuesday night. So now you know why I was loath to set the ball rolling. Old man Patterson would lift the sky to get the chance to have that young waster imprisoned, to say nothing of defaming my personal character at the same time. "'Sooner than that I must endeavour to raise sufficient money by private means to replace the notes. But the death of old Simmons is, of course, another matter. His murderer must and shall be brought to justice, while I have a penny piece in my pocket.' His voice broke suddenly into a harsh sob, and for a moment his hands covered his face. Then he shook himself free of his emotion. "'We will all do our best on that score, Mr. Brent,' said Mr. Narkom, after a somewhat lengthy silence. "'It is a most unfortunate tragedy indeed, almost a dual one, one might say. But I think you can safely trust yourself in our hands, eh, Headland?' Cleek bowed his head, while Mr. Brent smiled appreciation of the superintendent's kindly sympathy. "'I know I can,' he said warmly. "'Believe me, Mr. Narkom, and you too, Mr. Headland.' I am perfectly content to leave myself with you. But I have my suspicions, and strong ones they are too, and I would not mind laying a bet that Patterson has engineered the whole scheme and is quietly laughing up his sleeve at me. That's a bold assertion, Mr. Brent, put in Cleek quietly. But justified by facts, Mr. Headland, he has twice tried to bribe Simmons away from me, and last year offered Calcott, my head clerk, a sum of five thousand pounds to let him have the list of our clients. "'Oh, ho!' said Cleek, in two different tones. "'One of that sort, is he? Not content with a fortune won by profiteering, he must try and ruin others. And having failed to get hold of your list of clients, he tries the bogus theft game and gambles on that. "'Hm! Well, young Barrington may be only a coincidence.' "'After all, Mr. Brent, I shouldn't worry too much about him if I were you. "'Suppose you tell Mr. Narkom and myself the details. "'Right from the beginning, please. "'When was the murder discovered, and who discovered it?' "'Mr. Naylor Brent leaned back in his chair and sighed heavily as he polished his gold glasses. "'For an affair of such tragic importance, Mr. Headland, he said, "'it is singularly lacking in details.' There is really nothing more to tell you than that at six o'clock, when I myself retired from the bank to my private rooms overhead, I left poor Simmons on guard over the safe. At nine o'clock I was fetched down by the inspector on the beat, who had left young Wilson with the body. After that, Cleek lifted a silencing hand. One moment, he said. Who is young Wilson, Mr. Brent? And why should he, instead of the inspector, have been left alone with the body? "'Wilson is one of the cashiers, Mr. Headland, a nice lad, but of no particular education. It seems he found the bank's outer door unlatched, and called upon the constable on the beat. As luck would have it, the inspector happened along, and down they went into the vaults together. But as to why the inspector left young Wilson with the body, instead of sending him up for me, well, frankly, I had never given the thing a thought until now. "'I see.' Funny thing this chap Wilson should have made straight for the vaults, though. Did he expect a murder or robbery beforehand? Was he acquainted with the fact that the notes were there, Mr. Brent? No, he knew nothing whatever about them. No one did. That is, no one but the head clerk, Mr. Calcutt, myself, and old Simmons. In bank matters, you know, the less said about such things the better, and... Mr. Narkom nodded. "'Very wise, very wise indeed,' he said approvingly. "'One can't be too careful in money matters, "'and if I may say so, bank pay being none too high, "'the temptation must sometimes be rather great. "'I've a couple of nephews in the bank myself, 
Cleek's eyes suddenly silenced him as though there had been a spoken word. "'This Wilson, Mr. Brent,' Cleek asked quietly, "'is he a young man?' "'Oh, quite young. Not more than four or five and twenty, I should say. Came from London with an excellent reference, and so far has given every satisfaction. Universal favourite with the firm, and also with old Simmons himself. I believe the two used to sometimes lunch together, and were firm friends. It seems almost a coincidence that the old man should have died in the boy's arms.' "'He made no statement, I suppose, before he died, to give an idea of the assassin? "'But, of course, you wouldn't know that, as you weren't there.' "'As it happens, I do, Mr. Headland. "'Young Wilson, who is frightfully upset, "'in fact the shock of the thing has completely shattered his nerves, "'never very strong at the best of times, "'says that the old man just writhed and writhed "'and muttered something about a rope. "'Then he fell back dead.' "'A rope?' said Cleek in surprise. "'Was he tied or bound, then?' "'That's just it. There was no sign of anything whatever to do with a rope about him. It was possibly a death delusion, or something of the sort. Perhaps the poor old chap was semi-conscious. "'Undoubtedly. And now just one more question, Mr. Brent, before I tire your patience out. We policemen, you know, are terrible nuisances.' What time was it when young Wilson discovered the door of the bank unlatched? About half-past nine. I had just noticed my clock striking the half-hour when I was disturbed by the inspector. And wasn't it a bit unusual for a clerk to come back to the bank at that hour, unless he was working overtime? Mr. Naylor Brent's fine head went back with a gesture, which conveyed to Cleek the knowledge that he was not in a habit of working any of his employees beyond the given hours. "'He was doing nothing of the sort, Mr. Headland,' he responded a trifle brusquely. "'Our firm is particularly keen about the question of working hours. Wilson tells me he came back for his watch, which he left behind him, and—' "'And the door was conveniently unlatched and ready, "'so he simply fetched in the inspector "'and took him straight down into the vaults? "'Didn't get his watch, I suppose?' "'Mr. Naylor Brent jumped suddenly to his feet, "'all his self-possession gone for the moment. "'Gad! I never thought of that! "'Hang it! Man, you're making a bigger puzzle of it than ever! "'You're not insinuating that that boy murdered old Simmons, are you? "'I can't believe that!' "'I'm not insinuating anything,' responded Cleek blandly. "'But I have to look at things from every angle there is. "'When you got downstairs with the inspector, Mr. Brent, "'did you happen to notice the safe, or not?' "'Yes, I did. "'Indeed, I fear that was my first thought. "'It was natural, with two hundred thousand Bank of England notes to be responsible for, "'and at first I thought everything was all right. "'Then young Wilson told me that he himself had closed the safe door.' "'What are you smiling at, Mr. Headland? "'It's no laughing matter, I assure you.' "'The queer little one-sided smile, so indicative of the man, "'travelled for a moment up Cleek's cheek "'and was gone again in a twinkling. "'Nothing,' he responded briefly, "'just a passing thought. "'Then you mean to say young Wilson closed the safe. "'Did he know the notes had vanished? "'But, of course, you said he knew nothing of them. "'But if they were there when he looked in—' His voice trailed off into silence, and he let the rest of the sentence go by default. Mr. Brent's face flushed crimson with excitement. "'Why, at that rate,' he ejaculated, "'the money wasn't stolen until young Wilson sent the inspector up for me, and we let him walk quietly out. You were right, Mr. Headland, if I had only done my duty and told Inspector Corcoran at once. "'Steady, man, steady. I don't say it is so.' "'put in Cleek with a quiet little smile. "'I'm only trying to find light. "'And making it a dashed sight blacker still, "'begging your pardon,' returned Mr. Brent briskly. "'That's as may be, but the devil isn't always as black as he's painted,' "'responded Cleek. "'I'd like to see this, Wilson, Mr. Brent, "'unless he is so ill he hasn't been able to attend the office. "'Oh, he's back at work today, and I'll have him here in a twinkling.' And almost in a twinkling he arrived, a young, slim, pallid youngster, rather given to over-brightness in his choice of ties, and somewhat better dressed than is the lot of most bank clerks. Cleek noted the pearl pin, the well-cut suit he wore, 
and for a moment his face wore a strange look. Mr. Naylor Brent's brisk voice broke the silence. "'These gentlemen are from Scotland Yard, Wilson,' he said sharply, "'and they want to know just what happened here on Tuesday night. Tell them all you know, please.' Young Wilson's pale face went a queer drab shade like newly baked bread. He began to tremble visibly. "'Happened, sir? Happened?' he stammered. "'How should I know what happened? I, I only got there just in time, and—' "'Yes, yes, we know just when you got there, Mr. Wilson,' said Cleek. "'But what we want to know is what induced you to go down into the vaults when you fetched the inspector. "'It seemed a rather unnecessary journey, to say the least of it. "'I heard a cry, at least, right through the closed door of a nine-inch concrete-walled vault, Wilson?' "'struck in Mr. Brent promptly. "'Simmons had been shut in there by myself, Mr. Headland, and—' "'Shut in, Mr. Brent? Shut in, did you say? "'Then how did Mr. Wilson here and the inspector enter?' "'Young Wilson stretched out his hand imploringly. "'The door was open,' he stammered. "'I swear it on my honour. "'And the safe was open, and—and and the notes were gone.' "'What notes?' It was Mr. Brent's voice which broke the momentary silence, as he realized the significance of the admission. For answer, the young man dropped his face into his shaking hands. "'Oh, the notes! The two hundred thousand pounds! You may think what you like, sir, but I swear I am innocent. I never touched the money, nor did I touch my—Mr. Simmons. I swear it! I swear it!' "'Don't swear too strongly, or you may have to unswear again,' struck in Cleek severely. "'Mr. Narkom and I would like to have a look at the vault itself, and see the body, if you have no objection.' "'Certainly. Wilson, you had better come along with us. We might need you. This way, gentlemen.' Speaking, the manager rose to his feet, opened the door of his private office, and proceeded downstairs by way of an equally private staircase to the vaults below. Cleek, Mr. Narkom, and young Wilson, very much agitated at the coming ordeal, brought up the rear. As they passed the door leading into the bank for the use of the clerks, old Calcott came out and paused respectfully in front of the manager. "'If you excuse me, sir,' he said, "'I thought perhaps you might like to see this.' He held out a Bank of England five-pound note, and Mr. Brent took it and examined it critically." Then a little cry broke from his lips. "'A541063!' he exclaimed. "'Good heavens, Calcott, where did this come from? Who—' Calcott rubbed his old hands together as though he were enjoying a titbit with much satisfaction. "'Half an hour ago, sir, Mr. George Barrington brought it in and wanted smaller change.' "'George Barrington!' The members of the little party looked at one another in amazement and Cleek noticed for a moment that young Wilson's tense face relaxed. "'Mr. George Barrington, eh?' The curious little one-sided smile travelled up Cleek's cheek and was gone. The party continued their way downstairs, somewhat silenced by this new development. A narrow, dark corridor led to the vault itself, which was by no means a large chamber, but remarkable for the extreme solidity of its building. It was concrete, as most vaults are, and lit only by a single electric light, which, when switched on, shone dully against the grey stone walls. The only ventilation it boasted was provided by means of a row of small holes, about an inch in diameter, across one wall, that nearest to the passage, and exactly facing the safe. So small were they that it seemed almost as if not even a mouse could get through one of them, should a mouse be so minded. These holes were placed so low down that it was physically impossible to see through them, and though Cleek's eyes noted their appearance there in the vault, he said nothing, and seemed to pay them little attention. A speedy glance round the room gave him all the details of it, the safe against the wall, the figure of the old bank servant beside it, sleeping his last sleep, and guarding the vault in death as he had not been able to do in life. Cleek crossed toward him, and then stopped suddenly, peering down at what seemed a little twist of paper. Hello, he said. "'Surely you don't allow smoking in the vault, Mr. Brent? "'Not that it could do much harm, but—' 
"'Certainly not, Mr. Headland,' returned the manager warmly. "'That is strictly against orders.' He glared at young Wilson, who, nervous as he had been before, became obviously more flustered than ever. "'I don't smoke, sir,' he stammered, in answer to that managerial look of accusation. "'Glad to hear it,' Cleek stroked his cigarette-case lovingly inside his pocket, as though in apology for the libel. "'But it's my mistake, not a cigarette end at all, just a twist of paper. Of no account, anyway.' He stooped to pick it up, and then giving his hand a flirt, appeared to have tossed it away. Only Mr. Narkom, used to the ways of his famous associate, saw that he had palmed it into his pocket. Then Cleek crossed the room and stood a moment looking down at the body, lying there huddled and distorted in the death agony that had so cruelly and mysteriously seized it. So this was Will Simmons. Well, if the face is any index to the character, which in nine cases out of ten it isn't, then Mr. Naylor Brent's confidence had certainly not been misplaced. A fine, clean, rugged face this, with set lips, a face that would never fail a friend and never forgive an enemy. Young Wilson, who had stepped up beside Cleek, shivered suddenly as he looked down at the body and closed his eyes. Mr. Brent's voice broke the silence that the sight of death so often brings. "'I think,' he said quietly, "'if you don't mind, gentlemen, I'll get back to my office. "'There are important matters at stake just now, so if you'll excuse me. "'It's near closing time, you know, and there are many important matters to see to. "'Wilson, you stay here with these gentlemen, and render any assistance that you can. "'Show them round if they wish it. You need not resume work today. "'Anything which you wish to know, please call upon me.' "'Thanks. We'll remember.' Cleek bowed ceremoniously as the manager retreated. "'But no doubt Mr. Wilson here will give us all the assistance we require, Mr. Brent. We'll make an examination of the body first and let you know the verdict.' The door closed on Mr. Brent's figure, and Cleek and Mr. Narkom and young Wilson were alone with the dead. Cleek went down upon his knees before the still figure and examined it from end to end. The clenched hands were put to the keenest scrutiny, but he passed no comment, only glancing now and again from those same hands to the figure of the young cashier who stood trembling beside him. "'Hm, convulsions,' he finally said softly to himself, and Mr. Narkom watched his face with intense eagerness. "'Might be aconite, but how administered?' Again he stood silent his brain moving swiftly down an avenue of thought, and if the thoughts could have been seen, they should have shown something like this. Convulsions, writhing, twisting, tied up in knots of pain, a rope. Suddenly he wheeled swiftly upon Wilson, his face a mask for his emotions. "'Look here,' he said sternly. "'I want you to tell me the exact truth, Mr. Wilson. It's the wisest way when dealing with the police, you know.' Are you positively certain Simmons said nothing as to the cause of his death? What exactly were his last words to you? I begged him to tell me who it was who had injured him, replied Wilson, in a shaking voice. But all he could say was, The rope, mind the rope. The rope of fear, the rope of fear. And then he was gone. But there was no sign of any rope, Mr. Headland and I can't imagine what the dear old man was driving at. And now to think he is dead. Dead. His voice broke and was silent for a moment. Once again Cleek spoke. And you saw nothing? Heard nothing? Well, I hardly know. There was a sound, a faint whisper, reed-like and thin, almost like a long-drawn sigh. I really thought I must have imagined it, and when I listened again it had gone. After that I rushed to the safe and— Why did you do that? Because he had told me at dinner time about the notes, and made me promise I wouldn't mention it, and I was afraid someone had stolen them. Is it likely that anyone overheard your conversation then? Where were you lunching? In the Rose and Crown, Wilson's voice trembled again as though the actual recalling of the thing terrified him anew. Simmons and I often had lunch together. There was no one else at our table, and the place was practically empty, 
the only person near was old Ramagee, the black chap who keeps the Indian bazaar in the town. He's an old inhabitant, but even now hardly understands English, and most of the time he's so drugged with opium that if he did hear he'd never understand. He was certainly blind to the world that lunchtime, because my—my my friend, Simmons, I mean, noticed it. Indeed, Cleek stroked his chin thoughtfully for some moments. Then he sniffed to the air and uttered a casual remark. Fond of sweets still, are you, Mr. Wilson? Peppermint drops or aniseed balls, eh? Mr. Narkom's eyes fairly bulged with amazement, and young Wilson flushed angrily. I am not such a fool as all that, Mr. Headland, he said quickly. If I don't smoke, I certainly don't go about sucking candy like a kid. I never cared for him as a youngster, and I haven't had any for a cat's age. What made you ask? Nothing, simply my fancy. But nevertheless, Cleek continued to sniff, and then suddenly, with a little excited sound, went down on his hands and knees, and began examining the stone floor. It's not possible, and yet, and yet I must be right, he said softly, getting to his feet at last. A rope of fear was what he said, wasn't it? A rope of fear. He crossed suddenly to the safe, and bending over it, examined the handle and doors critically. And at the moment Mr. Brent reappeared. Cleek switched around upon his heel and smiled across at him. "'Able to spare us a little more of your valuable time, Mr. Brent?' he said politely. "'Well, I was just coming up. There's nothing really to be gained here. I've been looking over the safe for fingerprints, and there's not much doubt about whose they are. Mr. Wilson here had better come upstairs and tell us just exactly what he did with the notes, and—' Young Wilson's face went suddenly grey. He clenched his hands together and breathed hard like a spent runner. "'I tell you they were gone!' he cried desperately. "'They were gone! I looked for them and didn't find them! They were gone! Gone! Gone!' But Cleek seemed not to take the slightest notice of him, and, swinging upon his heel, followed in the wake of the manager's broad back, while Wilson, perforce, had to return with Mr. Narkom. Halfway up the stairs, however, Cleek suddenly stopped, and gave vent to a hurried ejaculation. "'Silly idiot that I am,' he said crossly. "'I have left my magnifying glass on top of the safe, and it's the most necessary tool we policemen have.' "'Don't bother to come, Mr. Brent, if you'll just lend me the keys of the vault. Thanks. I'll be right back.' It was certainly not much more than a moment when he did return, and the other members of the little party had barely reached the private office when he fairly rushed in after them. There was a look of supreme satisfaction in his eyes. "'Here it is,' he said, lifting the glass up for all to see. "'And look here, Mr. Brent. I've changed my mind about discussing the matter any further here.' The best thing you can do is to go down in a cab with Mr. Narkom to the police station, and get a warrant for this young man's arrest. No, don't speak, Mr. Wilson, I've not finished yet. And take him along with you. I will stay here and just scribble down the facts. It'll save no end of bother, and we can take our man straight up to London with us, under proper arrest. I shan't be more than ten minutes at the most. Mr. Brent nodded assent. As you please, Mr. Headland, he said gravely. We'll go along at once. Wilson, you understand you are to come with us? It's no use trying to get away from it, man. You're up against it now. You'd better just keep a stiff upper lip and face the music. I'm ready, Mr. Narkom. Quietly they took their departure, in a hastily found cab, leaving Cleek, the picture of stolid policemanism, with notebook and pencil in hand, busily inscribing what he was pleased to call the facts. Only ten minutes, Cleek had asked for, but it was nearer twenty before he was ushered out of the side entrance of the bank by the old housekeeper, and though perhaps it was only sheer luck that caused him to nearly tumble into the arms of Mr. George Barrington, whom he recognized from the word picture of that gentleman given by Mr. Brent some time before, it was decidedly by arrangement that after a few careless words on the part of Cleek, Barrington, his face blank with astonishment, accompanied this stranger down to the police station. They found a grim little party awaiting them, but at sight of Cleek's face Mr. Narkom started forward and put a hand upon his friend's arm. "'What have you found, Headland?' he asked excitedly. 
"'Just what I expected to find,' came the triumphant reply. "'Now, Mr. Wilson, you are going to hear the end of the story. "'Do you want to see what I found, gentlemen? "'Here it is.' "'He fumbled in his big coat pocket for a moment "'and pulled out a parcel which crackled crisply. "'The notes!' "'Good God!' it was young Wilson who spoke. "'Yes, a very good God, even to sinners, Mr. Wilson. "'We don't always deserve all the goodness we get, you know.' Cleek went on. The notes are found, you see. The notes, you murderer, you despicable thief. The notes which were entrusted to your care by the innocent people who pinned their faith to you. Speaking, he leapt forward, past the waiting inspector and Mr. Narkom, past the shabby, down-at-heel figure of George Barrington, past the slim, shaking Wilson, and straight at the substantial figure of Mr. Naylor Brent, as he stood leaning with one arm upon the inspector's high desk. So surprising, so unexpected was the attack, that this victim was overpowered, and the bracelet snapped upon his wrists before any one present had begun to realize exactly what had happened. Then Cleek rose to his feet. "'What's that, Inspector?' he said, in answer to a hurriedly spoken query. "'A mistake? Oh, dear, no. No mistake, whatever. Our friend here understands that quite well.' "'Thought you'd have escaped with that two hundred thousand pounds "'and left your confederate to bear the brunt of the whole thing, did you? "'Or else young Wilson here, whom you'd so terrorized? "'A very pretty plot indeed. "'Only Hamilton Cleek happened to come along instead of Mr. George Headland "'and show you a thing or two about plots.' "'Hamilton Cleek! "'The name fell from every pair of lips, "'and even Brent himself stared at this wizard whom all the world knew— and who unfortunately had crossed his path when he least wanted him. "'Yes, Hamilton Cleek, gentlemen, Cleek of Scotland Yard, and a very good thing for you, Mr. Wilson, that I happened to come along. Things looked very black for you, you know, and those beastly nerves of yours made it worse. And if it hadn't been for this cad's confederate—' "'Confederate, Mr. Cleek?' "'put in Wilson shakily. I, "'I don't understand. "'Who could have been his confederate?' "'None other than old Ramagee, responded Cleek. "'You'll find him drugged as usual in the Rosen Crown. "'I've seen him there only a while ago. "'But now he is minus a constant companion of his. "'And here is the actual murderer.' "'He put his hand into another capacious pocket "'and drew forth a smallish glass box.' "'The rope of fear, gentlemen,' he said quietly. "'A vicious little rattler of the most deadly sort. "'And it won't be long before that gentleman there "'becomes acquainted with another sort of rope. "'Take him away, Inspector. "'The bare sight of him hurts an honest man's eyes.' "'And they took him away forthwith, "'a writhing, furious thing, "'utterly transformed from the genial personality "'which had for so long swindled and outwitted a trusting public.' As the door closed upon them, Cleek turned to young Wilson and held out his hand. "'I'm sorry to have accused you as I did,' he said softly, with a little smile. "'But that is a policeman's way, you know. Strategy is part of the game. Though it was a poor trick of mine to cause you additional pain. You must forgive me. I don't doubt the death of your father was a great shock, although you tried manfully to conceal the relationship. No doubt it was his wish, not yours.' A sudden transformation came over Wilson's pale, haggard face. It was like the sun shining after a heavy storm. "'You knew?' he said over and over again. "'You knew?' "'Oh, Mr. Cleek, now I can speak out at last. Father always made me promise to be silent. He, he wanted me to be a gentleman, and he'd spent every penny he possessed to get me well enough educated to enter the bank. He was mad for money.' "'mad for anything which was going to better my position, "'and and I was afraid when he told me about the notes "'he might be tempted. "'Oh, it was dreadful of me, I know, to think of it, "'but I knew he doted upon me. "'I was afraid he might try and take one or two of them, "'hoping they wouldn't be missed out of so great an amount. "'You see, we'd been in money difficulties "'and were still paying my college fees off after all this time. "'So I went back to keep watch with him "'and found him dying.' though how you knew his voice trailed off into silence 
and Cleek smiled kindly. "'By the identical shape of your hands, my boy. I never saw two pairs of hands so much alike in all my life. And then your agitation made me risk the guess. What's that, Inspector? How was the murder committed, and what did this little rattler have to do with it?' "'Well, quite simple. The snake was put in the safe with the notes, and a trail of aniseed, of which snakes are very fond, you know, laid from there to the foot of old Simmons. The safe door was left ajar, though in the half-dusk the old man certainly never noticed it. I found all this out from those few words of Wilson's about the rope, and from his having heard a reed-like sound. I had to do some hard thinking, I can tell you. When I went downstairs again, Mr. Narkom, after my magnifying glass, I turned down poor Simmons' sock, and found the mark I expected. The snake had crawled up his leg and struck home. Why did I suspect, Mr. Brent? Well, it was obvious almost from the very first, for he was so anxious to throw suspicion upon Mr. Barrington here, and Wilson, with Patterson thrown in for good measure. Then again it was certain that no one else would have been allowed into the vault by Simmons, much less to go to the safe itself and open it with the keys. That he did go to the safe was apparent by the fingerprints upon it, and as they too smelt of aniseed, the whole thing began to look decidedly funny. The trail of aniseed led straight up to where Simmons lay, so I can only suppose that after Brent released the snake— the trail, of course, having been laid beforehand when he was alone, Brent must have stood and waited until he saw it actually strike, and— How do I know that, Mr. Wilson? Well, he smoked a cigarette there, anyhow. The stub I found bore the same name as those in his box, and it was smoked identically the same way as a couple which lay in his ashtray. I could only conclude that he was waiting for something to happen, and as the snake struck— he grabbed up the bundle of notes, quite forgetting to close the safe door, and rushed out of the vault. Ramagee was in the corridor outside, and probably whistled the snake back through the ventilating holes near the floor, instead of venturing near the body himself. You remember you heard the sound of that pipe, Mr. Wilson? Ramagee probably made his escape while the inspector was upstairs. Unfortunately for him, he ran right into Mr. George Barrington here, and when, as he tells me, he later told Brent about seeing Ramagee, well, the whole thing became as plain as a pikestaff. "'Yes,' put in George Barrington excitedly, taking up the tale in his weak, rather silly voice. "'My stepfather refused to believe me, and gave me twenty pounds in notes to go away. I suppose he didn't notice they were some of the stolen ones. I changed one of them at the bank this morning, but I had no idea how important they were, until I knocked into Mr... Mr. Cleek here, and he made me come along with him. Mr. Narkom looked at Cleek, and Cleek looked at Mr. Narkom, and the blank wonder in the superintendent's eyes caused him to smile. "'Another feather in the cap of foolish old Scotland Yard, isn't it?' he said. "'Time we made tracks, I think. Coming our way, Mr. Wilson? We'll see you back home, if you like. You're too upset to go on alone. Good afternoon, Inspector, and—' "'Good-bye. I'll leave the case with you. It's safe enough in your hands, but if you take my tip, you'll put that human beast in as tight a lock-up as the station affords.' Then he linked one arm in Mr. Narkom's, and the other arm in that of the admiring and wholly speechless Wilson, and went out into the sunshine. End of the Rope of Fear